questions today, our topic uh, this month. So Paul and I are chairing one each month. Um, they're, they're all they're all open data saves lives. So they're all the, the sort of a health focus. Paul's probably slightly more a technical bias. And what I'm trying to do is bring a, a sometimes a sort of policy and research focus to these. And hopefully people find that a kind of useful blend. Um, but they've been really well supported all through COVID. So we're very grateful uh, to those names popping up that we've seen a lot um, and to some of those new people that have joined us. Um, we've got three really good sessions on COVID and ethnicity. Provocatively, um, Paul and I and others have you know, said on Twitter and in other mediums that BAME is, is potentially not a useful term. Perhaps it never was. Um, I went to, for those who work in the NHS, I went to NHS Confed last year and we had a American professor of public health um, who proved that the American health system and the and the NHS are unwittingly, um, if everyone could just go on to mute as they come in, that would be great, um, that the American health system and the British one are unintentionally institutionally racist and uh, presented a number of quantitative analyses to, to back that up from the sort of tra tra some of the traditional research that's done about how many cars go past before a white person can cross the road, how many cars go past before a black person can cross the road, right through to putting the same uh, job application to the NHS and only changing the ethnicity on the application. Um, so uh, th there's a, an awful lot to go at um, and we we're cl clearly in a, um, a very interesting time with everything that's happened around Black Lives Matters, the, just on a related point, I would highly recommend the small acts films that have come out on BBC that Steve McQueen directed. Um, anyone like me who kind of grew up in South East London in the sort of 70s and 80s will enjoy those, but they're, they're fantastic viewing for everyone. So we have got 36 people in, which is fantastic. Um, we've got three brilliant speakers. We're going to take David Whiting first from, from Medway Council, um, who's going to do a presentation, which I'm assuming is going to in, encourage the use of R around trying to look at ethnicity and, and kind of COVID outcomes. So let's make a start, David. Um, feel free to share your screen and we'll we'll crack on. Okay. Um, believe it or not, it has nothing to do with R. Um, probably the only presentation wow. I've given in the last 10 years that doesn't <laughs> promote R. Okay. Uh, okay, is that working? That's great. Okay, great. Thanks. So, so um, this presentation is based largely around a, a sort of an overview needs assessment that we did um, a little while back now, sort of fairly early on in the um, the COVID epidemic, uh, because we realised that we needed to find out more and understand better our uh, population within Kent and Medway. And we initially found it actually surprisingly difficult to, to pull data together. So we um, we um, hired a uh, someone to work with us for about six weeks to try to pull together as much information as possible and just help us uh, get a better understanding of the of the population. Uh, there's about 20 odd slides here, so I might skip over over a few of them as we've um, only got a fairly limited amount of time. Uh, I was hoping to update this presentation before today, but uh, things have been a bit busy recently, so I haven't had a chance to do that. So the first thing we wanted to look at was what does that population look like? We wanted to understand where we had um, a greater proportion of our population from uh, non-white British groups. Um, so the options available to us were the National Census. Now this is the most reliable, but it was last done in 2011. It does provide us estimates down to ward level, so it gives us a fair amount of granularity. Um, there, were some, there are also some ONS estimates from 2017. Um, they're from the ONS, but they call them unofficial estimates that give us some data at local authority level. And there was also some work done by the University of Leeds that provides estimates through to the year 2061. Uh, so that, that provides us uh, um, sort of one way of uh, looking at data, so or getting the population data. Um, Things have changed quite a lot to it since 2011, so there's a real chance that the information is out of date. And the estimates from 2017 are only at local authority level, so that doesn't allow the sort of granularity that we wanted uh, for this work. Another option is to look at the school census. So that tells us the ethnicity on uh, those aged four to 18 years old. Um, it's done every year, so it's quite contemporary, um, but it's published by school, not by residents of the pupil. 
and particularly for secondary schools, you can have pupils coming from uh, considerable distances. Another thing that we looked at was GP practice registration information. Uh, this is not, ethnicity is not published uh, publicly. Um, but when we got access to, to the GP data, uh, we found that at a practice level, the completeness varied from about 20% to 99%. So some practices shown that definitely can be done, uh, but a number of other practices, quite a few practices not, um, not filling it in completely. And uh, when we worked out the numbers in total across Kent and Medway that had no ethnicity recorded, it was something like, I think about half a million patients. Um, so we estimated that if we had somebody working full time, spending three minutes per patient ringing around to ask their, their ethnicity, uh, they could probably get that filled in in about 22 years. So if we look at our resident population and the proportion um, by different uh, broad ethnic or by ethnic groups uh, across age groups and compared to England and the Southeast, we can see that we have a larger proportion in the younger age groups um, of those who are from uh, non-white British groups. Um, this is based on 2011 census um, and that number decreases as you might expect um, uh, uh, as uh, the population gets older. So we're more likely to have people from other groups uh, migrating to the UK uh, in, in the younger age groups than we are uh, of those 85 plus. So uh, just looking at the proportions, we see that in Kent about 10% of the, or 10, 11% of the population in 2011 was uh, non-white British, um, and about 15% of that time in Medway compared to about 20% in England. So even though we've got relatively low proportions here, um, in some uh, wards within uh, Kent and Medway, uh, we find the proportion is much higher. So there's a number of wards in Gravesham where the proportion is between sort of 35 and, and 50%. And in one ward in Medway at the time, it was about 30%, another ward, uh, 25%. So there are some areas where we have uh, greater concentrations of people from uh, non-white British backgrounds. From a public health perspective, we're very interested in the wider determinants of health and how they um, then impact on people's health outcomes. But there's a number of key items um, that are not published by ethnicity at local level. It's information on employment, physical activity in children or adults, uh, excess weight and obesity in adults, uh, smoking prevalence, uh, access to, to gardens, school readiness. All of these measures, quite important wider determinants. Um, there is ethnicity information at a national level, but we're not able to get it at a, at a local level. One important item that we are able to get at local level is job seekers allowance. Um, and this shows sort of an interesting pattern. So it shows that um, in particular in Medway, we have uh, quite a bit higher uh, uh, proportion of the population that have job seekers allowance compared to other districts in Kent. Um, but it also tends to show that in most districts, the proportion of those from um, non-white British groups um, who claim a job seeking allowance is greater than those from who are white British. But it is a little bit different in Tunbridge and Morling, where it's the other way around, and, and in Dover. And also perhaps in Maystone for men. But it's not, a, they're not, not everything is uh, negative for people from non-white British groups. So if we look at those who are not in education, employment or training, the proportions are higher in those who are um, from a white group. I, I'm not sure if that's white British or all white. I need to double check that. Um, and slightly lower in um, those from uh, non-white British groups. However, for other measures, uh, uh, the proportions are higher in uh, those from uh, non-white British groups. So for example, if we look at overweight and obesity uh, in children in Medway, um, in uh, reception and year six, we see that for white British groups, there, there is an increase going from year, uh, year R to year six, but that increase is much greater in, in certain groups. So particularly large in uh, Asian, and then males, Asian males and, and, and black females.
quickly look at uh, use of social services. So um, ethnicity is not recorded or stated for a quarter of our clients, which means that we need to take this information uh, with uh, a pinch of salt. But we see that uh, about 40%, the largest proportion of the clients are white British. Uh, but when we look at the rates per thousand based on the uh, population estimates for 2017, we see that there's a much higher proportion in those who are from, particularly from uh, the black population. Uh, then looking at uh, hospital data, looking at HES, um, we have quite a large proportion of um, uh, uh, patients where the ethnicity is unknown and it, it's higher in outpatients than it is for inpatients, about double. Um, so it's worth considering why we're not collecting ethnicity information uh, at outpatients uh, to, to, to the same degree that we are collecting it as for inpatients. Let's skip on quickly. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the um, uh, the last census was was 2011, so we're, we have to work for, with estimates going forward. If we look at the inpatient admissions for um, inpatient admission rate by ethnic group and financial year, we've e we've got something interesting happening. We've either got a fairly rapid change in our denominator, i.e., there is a migration changing the um, the, po the population uh, quite rapidly, or we have a very rapid increase in the need in uh, non-white British um, uh, groups, white, particularly in white other and, and in the black population. So in the white British population, the, the rate per thousand of admissions has not really changed over the last three years, but there's been a rise in white other and, uh, and black and oh, in fact, in all of them. So, so, so this does suggest to me that probably the, the denominator has changed quite quite rapidly over the last three three years or those three years covered there. Um, but either way, um, the the increase in need has uh, there has been an increase in need. And we see a similar thing for outpatients and A&E attendances. So then just looking at COVID, so when we first started, uh, Abraham and I uh, started putting a lot of effort into looking at um, the death data. And uh, we started working with the death registrations. So the uh, deaths are registered with Kent County Council and with Medway Council. And ethnicity is not recorded on the death certificate, which makes it impossible to use those data to do local analysis. Um, in public health, we also work with something called the primary care mortality database. This is a little bit in rears because the data has to go through the system. Um, it's about, about, yeah, about three months, up to three months in arrears. Um, but this does not record ethnicity either. So again, it limits what we can do in terms of uh, ethnicity, ethnicity analysis uh, with the death data. If we look at hospital admissions, so this is and this is now from a little while ago, and it would be good to update this to see if it has changed. If we look at the um, percent of admissions that had were positive for COVID at the time, um, the very broadly there wasn't much difference in terms of the proportions, but there was a difference in ages. So the majority of the um, patients were 40 to 64 years old in non-white British groups, um, whereas the white British patients tended to be 65 to 84 years old. Now, this could perhaps be related to the fact that, as we saw earlier, the, um, the proportions of the population that is uh, non-white British is different um, as you get older. Um, but yes, this is something that we uh, need to explore further. I'm going to skip that very quickly move to the summary. Um, so just overall in 20, 2011 census, Kent had a lower proportion of people from uh, BME groups than the Southeast. Um, and Medway had a lower proportion uh, than England, but some wards had between a quarter to a half of their population from non-white British groups. Uh, it's surprisingly hard to get a lot of key data uh, by ethnicity. Um, rates of social service use are higher in BME groups, um, and we've got a strange pattern in Medway that uh, I need to look into. Um, we have perhaps too many recorded as unknown in the hospital data, uh, 
Uh, and we've seen this rapid increase in admission rates uh, that could indicate a change in the population denominators or a rapid increase in need. And as I just said just now, if this is not recorded on death certificate, which lim limits analyses. Um, and um, COVID-19, I oh, don't remember covering that bit. So COVID-19 testing, great proportion of cases. Um, and I don't remember where that came from. Sorry about that, I'm floundering here. Um, and we have yeah, a greater proportion of the, uh, the COVID admissions are similar uh, in proportions across uh, the different ethnic groups. And that's be done very quickly. Thank you, David. That's really helpful. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions in the chat. If you've got time for a few questions. Okay. Um, just firstly from Paul. So there's quite a lot of data there in your, is that sort of data which is easy for you to get as a, as a sort of public health professional or is it, is it all freely accessible, for example, um, and is it easy to pull together? So is it there and is it easy to, to get? Part of the point of what we're doing with the Open Data Saves Lives is to try and get more data out there, get more eyes on it. But so how, how much of your work is just gathering data and how, how much of it is just within a secret club that only you're in? Or could everyone on this get to it? It's, uh, it was a mixture. So um, as I said, we, we hired somebody for six weeks to work on gathering the data and um, most of that six weeks was spent just trying to pull it all together. So uh, some of it was easy, other, other data was quite difficult to get hold of. Um, so we actually have, as part of this work, a grid of where the data sources come from, where the, each, of the data's come, data, each of the data sources for what's in the report, um, and with commentary about what's involved in actually getting it. So I could, could share that. Just let me come in that there. That would be helpful. If you, if, you, um, if you could share that with us, um, the ODI leads team will put it onto our data assets that we put part of um, Open Data Saves Lives so everyone gets a benefit. So uh, we'll pick that up as an action and follow up on that. Okay, we'll do. Great, thank, th thanks Paul. A quick question for me, David, if I may, sort of chairs prerogative. What about staff? So one of the potential, one of the news stories early on and, and still is, if there are significant differences by ethnicity, then perhaps we need to pull certain staff back from the front line. Is that something that the public health would look at? And if so, how might you go about that type of data analysis as opposed to patients? Okay, so we have a separate work stream that's looking at ethnicity and staff. So my, my, my part was focused just on, on population parameters. Um, okay. So there, there's quite a bit of work that's happening um, with staff uh, in terms of trying to look at the, yeah, looking at the proportion of staff from different ethnic groups who are needing to take time off because of COVID. Um, and also looking at uh, surveying the staff and uh, providing messaging for the staff. Okay, really helpful. Um, there's some really good stuff coming through in the chat, particularly around ethnicity and death certificates, which I think we will pick up and hopefully write about this. Paul would say that our model is uh, write a blog about what we're trying to do, provide a technical blog and provide the code. Um, John, John Bibby's here has said that what you've presented is really helpful and I Apologies, I because I'm used to hearing you talk about R. Um, what we want to try and do, and I'm sure you'll be up for, um, is to share how you've done this. Uh, and we had a really good presentation last month from um, a council in Yorkshire, where they'd built some fantastic local um, uh, interactive mapping. And it seems madness that we could just roll that out into every other local authority. So if you're happy to um, share the slides, which which we've got, um, to share any code that you're doing in R. Um, and to share the sort of templates, then then John and others can just take other local authorities and just push their data through that. So, yeah, very happy if you're to. happy with all of that, David, we that's brilliant. So we'll do that separately, and then John, thanks for the question, and we'll publish it all um, as resources on Open Data Saves Lives. That's great. Okay, thank you very much, David. I know you're crazy busy because of uh, hope potentially imminent vaccines. I'm hearing sort of draft project plans of things starting to happen over the next couple of weeks, which is really exciting. Um, but I know you're also still heavily involved in analysing the testing data. So thanks for kind of making time. Um, we're, um, we're, we've got a minute or so over, so we're, we're fine for time. So Abby, you're on next. Um, thanks very much for uh, coming on. If you want to share your screen. Um, and from chatting to Fraser on the previous call, this is um, potentially more sort of qualitative look, which I think is really helpful because I, I have a, and I'll blame Richard as, as my kind of mentor when he's on next, but I have a very sort of quant focus um, always. So really, really, um, really nice to get you on and to have a more sort of qualitative look at this as well. So um, over to you, 
Um, please, people, ask away in the chat, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarise the questions for Abby at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you can all see my screen. I'm just checking. Thank you. Um, so as Mark said, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a difference um, to uh, what you've uh, been hearing. So uh, this is about a qualitative exploration. Um, when, the, when the data around uh, the disproportionate impact of COVID started to uh, appear, um, we thought we would do Oops, um, we uh, at the strategy unit. So, so those of you who don't know, I, I don't know what this, who, who the strategy unit are. We're uh, kind of a, and we describe ourselves to be an NHS consultancy. Uh, we do uh, research, uh, evidence uh, analysis, um, and with research and evaluation, we mean qualitative and quantitative. And I think most of you will be very familiar with the team that um, Stephen Wyatt leads. Um, Mohammed uh, Mohammed is involved in as well, and there are analytics. But we're the different, we're the other side. Um, so we do qualitative work um, as well as evidence uh, analysis. And, and those of us who are ethnically diverse um, within the strategy unit were a bit disappointed with some of the narrative that was coming out in the in the, in, in the national narrative with regard to ethnicity and COVID. Um, and it was just all about deprivation and you know multi um, um, uh, occupancy house, household. And actually some of us couldn't relate to any of that. Um, but yet our families, our parents, our, our um, uh, fr wider friends um, were, were subject to some of the sort of same risks. Um, so we thought there's something around that we're missing in the, in the data that we're looking at, and, and that was the quality of the individual stories of uh, people. So we funded a self, uh, uh, an internal piece of work to have a look at um, the stories that we, um, uh, the, to, to, just to identify and explore some of these stories. So it was a little bit scoping in terms of what we were doing, um, and we were using it to build um, some evidence on um, what, you know, future mixed method studies. Um, so what we did, um, we went out to our own network. So in qualitative studies, you can say uh, it was a bit of an opportunity, uh, opportunistic example. Um, and then we snowballed it a little bit. We went out nationally and just explored people so that the requirement to participate was that you've had COVID. Um, at the time in the first wave, as you all know, uh, people were necessarily being tested, especially if they did go uh, um, end up in hospital. Um, so these were uh, individuals who, who mainly self-identified but had all the classic symptoms of having um, had COVID. So all of these people are anonymized, uh, student anonymized, um, and you can see by the ethnicity that the majority of people that we spoke to were South Asian, um, interestingly, what happened was with um, people who identified as black, when we asked them about the study um, to participate, they were very um, uh, asking, uh, they, they were very much more informed around the public health study that was going on at the time. Um, and, um, and then when um, Black Lives Matter um, started to happen, the, the, the kind of the, the movement started, people were asking questions about how this uh, piece of work related to that as well. Um, what you'll see is that whilst we did not go um, out to uh, recruit people who worked in public health sector, a lot of the people identified of their household identified as working within public health, uh, uh, within um, uh, public sector um, within that. So there was a range of people, including um, occupations that were at the front line, so including um, a service industries like um, taxi uh, drivers as well. So what do we do? We asked them a, a set of questions. Um, so they, we, from a qualitative approach, this was a semi-structured interview, but less structured. We were trying to find a way of combining that with narrative interviews. So we had a few main questions that we wanted to ask around um, their, you know, how COVID came into their household, what the, their occupation, how that impacted on their having COVID, um, the community that they identified with, where they lived, and then their, their use of health services within uh, at the time of the pan at the time of having the infection um, or, or suffering from um, the, the symptoms. And then the, the wider impact of national policy and guidelines and what impact that, that had on their uh, on their lives at the time. 
And what you'll see at the top is the, the, the bold is those questions that we ask, but then the responses that we got, um, we, we themed them, um, and you can see the different things that they talked about. And I'm just going to run you through um, some of the main points that came through. So uh, um, these slides will be shared, so I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail. You'll know uh, with Qualitative that there's a lot of uh, a lot of, a lot of words to distill, um, but I've just highlighted some uh, some quotes from the individuals and um, some key points. So what was really interesting um, from a national kind of the, the policy uh, level, most people would have said that the lockdown came too early. They were all able to identify other countries, other places, whether their friends or family came from there, or, or, or just saying, you know, people take, took different um, rules, um, followed different rules, um, and, and things like borders could have been closed earlier um, to be able to capitalize fully on um, lockdown. Um, but the majority of people, when we spoke to them and as the ethnicity, a uh, disproportionate impact on uh, ethnicity was coming out, most people were very frustrated that all of these inequalities were known. These were not new things for people um, from diverse uh, backgrounds and actually did it really need to take COVID to, for us to act on it? And, you know, equally as someone who works in the health services, the, uh, this, uh, this um, current focus on health inequalities is fantastic. But actually, you know, could we have lost a lot, uh, fewer people um, if we had paid attention to these things earlier? So when we talked about the occupation, most people refer, um, uh, referred to their occupation or household um, individuals occupation and that's how COVID came into their household. What we were not expecting is how much people related this back to their um, organization itself and the structural inequalities. And this is why I was uh, making the point about lots of people came from public sector, even though we did that specifically um, a, um, a target for that in our, in our kind of sampling. Um, and most people who worked in the NHS, and this was ranged from consultant level down to admin of a community team, would say that there was poor representation of their ethnicity in senior management and one of the things that did, uh, that um, that the the risks to uh, different ethnicities was not taken into account fully at the big at the very beginning uh, was was due to that um, that people just not understanding that there is um, something that could be done about this when it comes to the discussion around where people lived um, and the uh, and, and the kind of ethnicity relating so, so some of the things that David was um, just talking about um, and, and how that impacts on um, on, on people's life uh, styles within our South Asian population especially people chose to live where they were comfortable where they had their community kind of infrastructure so uh, be it temples or, or mosques um, but also where they were subjected to less racism. So they could be poorer um, areas. Um, you could be a, a kind of affluent member of that community, but you chose to live there because it felt safe from a personal and from a professional perspective. And also because it, it, you, know, it, it, you shared the values of that community. Um, and it, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, opportunity through the pan pandemic was, uh, was in some cases to strengthen some of that. It was interesting. So for most people um, in professional situations and also speaking uh, from the strategy unit behalf of those of us who are doing this piece of work, um, one of the questions we face in our profession, like especially during the first wave, was do you know someone who's had COVID? And actually, when you were a member of, uh, you know, uh, specific ethnic groups, um, you, this piece, th that information was relentless. So the number of people that you knew who had COVID, who died from COVID, was, was an everyday occurrence. So I knew that the second wave of the pandemic was happening when my dad started sending me the, so the mosque, his local mosque, my, my parents live up north in Bolton. So that he started sending me the most circular about the, the deaths and the funerals that were happening um, on that day. So I knew the first wave very early September and um, that that was happening up north. Um, so, so these were the kind of things that at some point people were, were switching off because the, uh, the news was, um, was overwhelming. <laughs> 
when it came to individual family members and um, trying to contain the infection, one when the infection was um, was happening or following lockdown procedures, with um, and again I speak about South Asian families because those were the the the, the kind of the, the, the dominant group in there within our sample. Um, most people found it very difficult to follow the social distancing um, because households were used to, even if they were not living in the same household, so even when the extended family members were living in different households, there was always a frequent thing about once every week or almost every evening, you know, people were just coming back to and forth, especially where you've got a, um, the uh, elderly, um, so your, your, uh, your, the parents in a multi-generation um, extended family living, so that was the hub of the household. And different people had different opinions on how lockdown should be followed, how the, how the rules should be followed, and that created quite some tension um, within individual family members. When it, when it comes to um, health and care and using um, health services, um, so there was quite a bit about using your own personal networks. Most people found NHS 111 um, um, and, and accessing that and the advice that was followed to be pretty poor actually. And so they used their own, what they would have normally done for kind of flu or cold to be able to manage at home when they didn't need to have a, a kind of a seek further assistance. Um, where they need, did need to seek further assistance, they relied on their own personal networks. Every people knew other people who worked in the health services, whether they were a doctor or whether they were someone who did, was in the support services. So they would reach out to those individuals um, in the first place to see what they should do. Um, where we found from a national, so other pieces of work that we're doing, qualitative pieces of work that we're doing around use uh, and a service use um, during the time of the pandemic, um, we know that people were reluctant in the first wave to use hospital based services because they didn't want to inundate the NHS. Um, and also they don't want to catch COVID if they didn't have COVID within the hospital uh, setting. But actually when it came to South Asian families, there was something else uh, there as well. People did not want to go into hospital even when they, there was a need to because they felt that they would suffer alone. They did not want to be that. They would rather suffer um, at home uh, with family members nearby rather than having to be in hospital. And then um, one of the, the interesting thing about the feedback to some of this work is that there's some conspiracy ideas um, uh, that people will be going into hospital and they will be they will not come back out alive. So there is there, is, there are those challenges as well um, and, and things that need communicating better. Um, in terms of the, there was one person that we interviewed who lost his father and his account of bereavement is quite something to, to, to read. Um, and, um, and one of the th points that he makes is about the absence of the usual religious and cultural practices that had to occur in isolation um, and how different that was to, to, to the norm. Um, and most of the cultural practices are, are social around, um, around bereavement. There is no um, understanding that there is, um, that you should grieve alone. Grieving is a social thing. Um, and so the difficulty is that this family faced and having to having to go through that um, uh, it, it will have um, you know tra a trauma for the for, for, a, for a long period. Okay, so that's the end of the finding sides. Um, what does this mean, especially for for those of you who work with numerical data? Um, and I think one of our interviewees made this point really uh, well. Um, and I think it's it's one of the points that Mark started off with as well, that the, the, the tendency that we have to label things as either non-white or BAME um, has got to go. Um, nobody that we speak to um, who are ethnically diverse identifies with this BAME. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work going on um, post uh, Black Lives Matter um, movements that kind of encourages, uh, that, that has come to this perspective. So BAME is a very much a, a, a UK wide um, acronym and, and those of us who would be labeled as BAME do not identify as BAME. Um, so let's, let's do something about breaking it down and actually say what we mean. 
Um, and when it comes to understanding and, 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 and interpreting the data, uh, let's not make assumptions. So how do we do that? So I think first is, is let's disaggregate the data and what works in Kent and Medway might be very different to what works in Birmingham where I'm, uh, where I'm based. Um, but let's let's try and break it down by gender, by ethnicity, um, by age, and a lot of things that are coming out in, in terms of generation. Um, religion is the main thing, and that 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 finding that I talked about in terms of um, where people choose to live. So uh, people from belonging to different ethnic groups might decide to live there not based on their um, occupation or their salary, but because of the community that is um, the needs that it serves. And I think it's incumbent upon each of us working with ethnicity data to ask ourselves questions about the origins of the people. So when you see that, you know, if it's South Asian, uh, what does that mean in terms of religions? What does that mean in terms of life, uh, types of lifestyle? We already know that Indians as a subgroup of South Asian has a very, uh, maybe in some places have a different experience of education than in other places. Um, and, and there's something around where within your data and the, for the region that you're looking at, the area that you're looking at, there are hard to reach communities where you, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't reach out to them. There are lots of um, community groups who are working um, to understand, to improve um, inequities and inequalities, and we, we can all work harder to reach those um, population groups. And just the last slide, just to, I, to, to make the point um, about um, labels, one of the things that when I look at the, um, um, the ethnicity data, um, the, uh, the, the quantitative uh, ethnicity data, you always ask about well, how, how have we got to this place in terms of inequalities um, and inequities. And um, during the COVID pandemic, lots of people are saying, you know, you know, we need to look at the social science behind all of this and, and, and why things are. But I would say we need to go a step back and look at history. So we need to involve historians in the terms of uh, interpreting some of this data. And this particular infographic comes from, um, uh, uh, I think it's based out of Leeds as well, um, uh, but a, a, an organization that works uh, uh, around uh, migration. And we have to understand that the reason that some of these inequities and inequalities exist are fundamentally in, in the UK are to do with slavery. And then second, to do with the indentured labor that followed um, slavery. So South Asian migration that we have in this country is, is, is to do with the British uh, moving um, people from South Asia as indentured laborers uh, to all over the world. Um, and then the second round of migration following colonial, uh, colonialization that then went into the different countries. Um, and some of these is now regarded as twice and thrice migrants and, and, and some of the inequities that have raised because of the origins. Not all, but uh, lots of these inequities have become that. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening. Abby, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, there's lots of comments and questions in the chat and I might leave you to answer those while we move on, just to just to keep us to time, a, a couple of quick points for me. I think that history session is something that we should perhaps look at and do a future session on, just because it's really really interesting. Um, and the second thing, what we're trying to do with Open Data Saves Lives is to be that quite sometimes abrasive voice to say Bain is not an acceptable definition. So as public as public servants, you and I. I think we need to come together to form a not always polite but loud voice to say this is the wrong lens through which to look at this and I think if we all have lots of small voices we're just trying to get them all like that cheesy graphic you see where the kind of loads of shoulder fish are bigger than the sharks sort of thing so we're just trying to gather all the fish together so we can kill the shark in the center um, so that's something I was chatting to Fraser about before so we might pick that up separately it's a lot of conversation but thank you again it's absolutely fascinating so we're, we're okay for time. Uh, we're very lucky we've got Richard Weber now, who I was fortunate enough to work for um, and has been uh, doing work in the area of what I would call still called sort of geodemographics um, for his, his whole career, and which influenced mine and, and some others who are on this call. Um, so Richard, over to you. I know you've done some work looking at, um, looking at why we should get rid of BAME um, and some more creative ways of looking at ethnicity by looking at people's names. So. If you can share your slides and the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, very good. <laughs>
Well, can I first of all thank you, Mark, for inviting me. And second, I'd like to thank Abeda because I think what you said is very good, um, not just in itself, but it, it seems to me a very fit introduction to what I want to talk about, which is, as Mark was suggesting, whether BAME is really a useful comment. And I think you made some very good points about how different the cultures are, even though the experiences of different immigrant communities may be different. So what I want to do is to talk to you as to why I think we've got a dilemma. Some people say, well, all BAME or non-white British people are suffering from historical victimhood. Uh, others people say, well, they're all from totally differentiated cultures. So the question is, do we group them all together or do we not group them all together? Or do we do one in some circumstances and the other in others? We also, I think, have somewhat of a dilemma because at the one level we can say, well, two out of the three top members of the cabinet are from minorities, so we've resolved the problem of discrimination. On the other hand, you get episodes such as the one on the right where a barrister continuously being confused with a defendant. And both of those are going on at the same time. And if we simply based our views on anecdotes, we could come to very different conclusions. So I thought it was useful to start off because if we think of Black Lives Matter and what motivates it, a lot of interest nowadays is in considering the restitution that we need to make for previous victimization. And if you think about it, I think different groups have had both different types of victimization and different levels. So I think many of you would agree that the worst um, victimization that have occurred is what has been experienced by Jews and also to some extent by Armenians, Holocausts, uh, where in, an entire race, um, or the plan was to eliminate an entire race and there was mass deliberate murder. Now, how that compares with slavery is difficult really to judge, uh, but there are clearly atrocities um, that happened there, which we're still very conscious of. But in America, uh, emancipation of the slaves didn't end discrimination. And you could argue that what went on under Jim Crow was even more terrifying and traumatic uh, for the black population. And because that happened in America, but didn't happen to the same degree here, I think to some extent, we don't entirely understand uh, the, ang the legitimate anger of many black Americans about their past, which is not necessarily shared uh, with um, black um, British. Then we have the issue of colonization. Um, and to what extent do, did people experience the same trauma and victimhood as colonized peoples as they did as slaves or subject to Jim Crow and Holocaust? And I think most people may agree that there's a kind of gradient in all this and some wrongs were even worse than others. So we've got a gradient there that affects different um, minority populations to different extents. And I think if we then look at the current impact of discrimination, um, we see different forms there that affect different groups. So I think um, in my childhood, um, the biggest source of discrimination uh, was due to appearance. And that's not just color, but also if we look on the right, there was huge discrimination uh, for many, many decades uh, about the East Asians, particularly in America and the Chinese um, in particular. And then I think differences in terms of appearance uh, sort of moved on to differences um, in ethnicity or racial origin. So my brother, my mother, for example, was enjoined when she was a child in all the shot never to play with the Irish. And we often forget that the Irish themselves, when they originally arrived in Britain, was subject to many similar um, disadvantages and discriminations as West Indians did later. No colored, no Irish, no children, for example. And then more recently, I think the source of, of popular discrimination has focused much more on customs, religion, and dress. And people have even said, well, people are all right provided they play cricket. And then I think the point that Abeda made is very pertinent that where people live is also becoming a source of discrimination. 
and there's popular disquiet about South Asians who live in entirely South Asian communities, which wouldn't apply to South Asians like those in the cabinet who live in predominantly white areas. So where you live in itself becomes a source of discrimination. And I think we should recognize that increasingly in a digital age, your name becomes a source of discrimination because it gives away the fact that you're foreign or not British. Not only do you look different, but your name looks different. And that is often used as a basis for discrimination, which is why we have a name blind recruitment. So I think those are important sort of theoretical reasons to, to suppose why it is that different communities should have uh, different historical experiences and different current experiences, both in terms of uh, victimhood and discrimination. Now, that may be theoretical, and what I want now want to do is to try to explain why I think we've got good quantitative and practical reasons for believing that different groups should be considered differently when it comes to public policy. So um, nowadays we can identify right down to postcode level and right up to the year 2020 using name recognition systems, the extent to which different minority communities live in different areas. So if we take BAME, for example, are Lithuanians part of BAME? They are not, they are white, so they're not black, but they are a minority ethnic group. But how often do we actually think of the specific circumstances of Lithuanians in a place like Burton-on-Trent, uh, where they go and work uh, close to, well, they live close to the brewery because that's where uh, traditionally the worst jobs were that British people didn't want to do and we imported Lithuanians to do them. So the geographical variations within the BAME community are enormous and even within subgroups that the government uses to do analysis. So for example, if we look at ward level for 2020 using name recognition data uh, for Sikhs, we find the geographical distribution is very different from that of Tamils and um, Sri Lankans, for example, but we group them both together as though they were identical parts of the South Asian community. Um, if we look at this terrible category, white other, which can include Filipinos uh, or Greek Cypriots, uh, they don't live where Romanians live, they live in totally different areas. And if people live in different areas, it suggests that they don't have an awful lot in common. And the Turks, again, although they may live close to the Cypriots, they live in actually quite distinct parts of North London. They don't mix uh, geographically. And if they don't mix geographically, it's probably because they're not of a similar cultural orientation. And anybody who knows Turks and Greeks will know that they are not of a similar orientation. But if we go and look at Mark Farr's data for East Kent, uh, almost all people of Turkish names will call themselves uh, white other, will be classified that way. And I didn't realize until last year the extent to which Ghanaians and Nigerians are different. I just was happy to group them all up as West Africans. But that's where the Ghanaians live and that's where the Nigerians live in London. Very different and are two different communities with different occupations and different values and different customs. And it's very easy for us of those of us who are white European to assume that they're similar, just as presumably for a Chinese person or a person of Chinese origin, they would imagine that Italians and British people were very similar, but we wouldn't see it that way, would we? So there are huge differences within those communities. And when you look at London, although most groups are spread out uh, all over London, each has its own heartland. And those heartlands, I think, are important to use as data items for analysis. So instead of just coding people by what their name suggests they are or what they think they are, I think, and this again goes back to what Abed has said, it's actually very important to code them by the type of neighborhood they live in. Now that's a ward coding, but we also have a postcode coding system to say which is the dominant community. And South Asians who live in South Asian postcodes, I believe, behave very differently, have, have very different attitudes from people who would describe themselves as South Asian, but actually live in neighborhoods which are not primarily South Asian. So we've looked a little bit about geography, um, but I think it's also interesting and important to look at behaviors too. And there's a lot of assumption, particularly in the analysis of COVID, that somehow 
um, the experience of, of all different BAME categories is, um, can be considered as identical. And what I think is very interesting about this slide is that we can see that many um, minority communities have a very high risk of exposure to COVID because many of them actually work in occupations which have a very large number of daily contacts uh, with different people. But what I think is equally interesting is that although that characteristic pervades virtually all minority groups, uh, they each individual minority group tends to be in a different sort of occupation that has high levels of exposure to people. So if we look at minicab drivers, they mostly come from Pakistan, an awful lot of care workers are West African, Filipinos go into nursing, Tamils, I bet you didn't know this, are particularly likely to be sitting behind a checkout in the supermarket. Black Africans are often chosen as bouncers, West Indians came here to drive buses, and Bangladeshis are waiters. So we've got many different uh, BAME categories, but look how different the uh, occupations are. And even if we go to look at the names of people who work in the Royal Free Hospital, as we did a few years ago, we find if we look at the ratio of staff to residents, we see BAME categories, or rather sub BAME categories, or people who would be put in the same BAME group, like Tamils and Bangladeshis, who are totally different in terms of their representation among the staff compared with patients. So Bangladeshis, by and large, don't go working in the hospital, but they do appear as patients, whereas Sarankans and Tamils uh, do work in the hospitals much more than they occur as patients. Um, and actually, if we look at what occupations they do in the hospital, again, we find that each uh, minority group has its own specialization. And this, I think, is quite an interesting slide. And again, it's rather interesting when we compare it with the map we saw in um, Abeda's presentation. People come to Britain um, from different countries and they bring particular occupational preferences with them. So if they come from South Africa, they very often come and practice dentistry. Um, the West Africans particularly work in care homes and security, the Irish in pubs and building sites, um, the Hindu Indians and the Sikhs run post offices, the Tamils uh, run petrol stations, um, Iranians practice dentistry, the Greeks run restaurants. And you look at this slide, which was created by looking at the relationship between names and people who are directors of different standard industrial classifications at companies house. And you can't really look at that slide and believe that there are no cultural differences between BAME groups. I mean, all of those differences reflect differences in culture and experience, which have very little, in my opinion, to do with um, colonization. A bit they do, but if that was the principal reason for their differences, you wouldn't see anything as interesting as that map. Now, uh, what we've got here, and I hope you can see the slide because some of it's a bit hidden away, um, but I'm a, a trustee of this um, small uh, theatre and we find three particular BAME groups don't tend to turn up. The three with uh, an index of about a fifth of national average, but East Asians do, and Jewish are two and a half times overrepresented. And that's even comparing the bookers with the London profile. Um, so these represent groups whose cultural performances don't seem to be um, congruent with what's put on um, in the theater. And here we've got some data using Mosaic, which shows, and I won't go into this in detail, but you hopefully might want to look at it as a slide later, how different types of neighborhood tend to attract different um, BAME categories. Um, so particularly uh, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis live in totally different types of neighborhood in terms of Mosaic than Sikhs and Hindu Indians. And the worst council housing um, or most deprived tends to be occupied by neither of those groups, um, but actually by Vietnamese uh, and Ethiopians. And here's another very busy slide, but it's interesting in America, if you look at the names of all the people who have been elected as public officials, the groups that are by far the least likely to be elected are Vietnamese, Cantonese and Mandarin. 
And that doesn't reflect discrimination. That reflects the fact that they don't really find the political uh, system that interesting as a way of uh, developing the, the power of their minority group or their own advancement. And you get exactly the same in Britain, that East Asians are the least likely to stand as councillors. And in the last election, I think we uh, elected our very first uh, Chinese British MP for Happened, I think it was. So I think if you look at both at behavior and geography, it's very difficult to argue um, that um, BAME groups are sufficiently similar in terms of behavior. Obviously, we disaggregate to four or five different categories. Um, but in our experience, we should be really going down to about 50 recognizable subgroups. And there's absolutely no technical or organizational or even financial problem of applying those categories to all major data sets. Uh, the reason it's not done is partly inertia. I think it's more inertia than ignorance. Uh, but there's absolutely no resource or technical obstacle to knowing all the things that we know, but disaggregated by a much finer set of ethnic categories than what we currently use. And anything you can do to do that, I think, will help both us uh, and it'll also help you and the public at large. So thank you very much, uh, Mark, and I'll finish now. Richard, that's fascinating. Um, we, could, we could do a whole day on this. Um, we always promise to finish bang on time, so I'll make sure we do. Um, I'll just answer, I'll just go to a couple of comments in the chat. So there was a, a question from a leader about people kind of moving out of cities, a kind of internal movement, which you presented to us um, down in Kent when you came down to talk to us about the ethnic profile of uh, the Medway towns changing and how um, the, the sort of fringe around Kent used to be very working class, but actually is becoming gentrified. So in between censuses, Rich has done a lot of work looking at how you can monitor that year by year. Uh, just a just a quick question, Richard, which has come up from Terry, I think. Would you, what might you say about um, travellers and the and the Romani population? What, what's what's possible to measure? Um, what's not? Well, the answer to that is is I know nothing about that, and I don't think I can tell you anything. Uh, because I don't okay. recognise that they've got distinctive names. But if I can go back very quickly to Kent, both Dartford and Gravesham mm. councils do have uh, current um, ethnicity data down to postcode level. And the growth in non-white British populations in those two boroughs is some of the highest of anywhere in Britain. And it's particularly Sikhs and Nigerians that have moved into the two of them. And many of them moved in because the housing is cheap and they've got quick access to central mm. London jobs. Brilliant. Okay, it's one minute to 12. We always promise to let you go on time, so we will do. I'm, I'm just grateful to all the speakers for joining in. We will publish all of the material and we will take everything that's come through in the chat, which has been some really helpful links, conversations, questions, and write it up and put it out there for you to contribute to. Um, Paul, do you want to say, if you want to do 10 seconds on what we're going to do in January? Yeah, 10 seconds. So today was our 20th Open Data Saves Lives um, session for 2020. We're going to take the 21st as a breather, two weeks time before Christmas, and the ODI leads and beautiful information team are going to review what we've done this year, um, what's worked best, and, and also plan for 2021. Uh, um, you'll see that we've got a new website, opendatesaveslives.org. We've had lots of people interested in our approach to getting things done and how we do things and what we might do next year. Um, and we'll be sharing that information with everybody um, soon. But basically, people like Health Foundation, NHSX, NHS Digital, um, the CSUs, corporate sponsors want to get involved, but they're not quite sure how. So we're currently looking at... Of, of, um, Funding opendatasaveslives.org as a separate uh, organization that is a new institution to help us all um, with data. And, and who knew that having access to data would help us make uh, better decisions about health and social care in the 21st century? But apparently it does. People keep ringing us asking us where it is. So um, there's going to be lots of news about it last year, uh, next year. We would love you all to join in. Now you signed up, you're part of the family, part of the group. So we, you, it's going to be hard for you to get away. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to 2021. So, so please stay in touch. Uh, don't be strangers. Um, we're going to do a load more stuff next year. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Spread the word.
yeah. we'll come back to you. Take care. Have a good rest of your day.